Welcome physicists to today's video on photoelectric effect. This is the third of three part video series. This particular investigation is looking at the relationship between frequency and the maximum kinetic energy of photoelectrons. So let's dive straight into it. So for this investigation, our dependent variable is the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectrons, EK max. Our independent variable is the frequency of the incident light. Our controlled variable is the intensity of the light the cathode metal and the anode voltage. Our aim for this investigation is to investigate what effect, if any, the incident light frequency has upon the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectron. So let's look at the investigation method. Number one, we're using the FET photoelectric effect simulator. Number two, we're going to select the sodium cathode. Number three, set light intensity to 100%. Step number four, set stopping voltage to zero volts. Step five, set the wavelength to full right deflection in the infrared. Step six, select graph option number three, that is electron energy versus frequency graph. Step seven, move wavelength slider from full right to full left. Step eight, take a picture of the graph entered using the picture tool. And step nine, repeat steps one to eight for each of the cathode metals. Let's now have a look at the FET photoelectric effect simulator. Welcome to the FET photoelectric effect simulator. Let's go through our investigation. So step one was to load up our FET photoelectric simulator. Step two was to select the sodium, and that was the top option here, the sodium cathode. Select light intensity to 100%, so we maximize our light intensity. Set stopping voltage to zero, that's where it is. Set wavelength to full right deflection into the infrared. Okay, that kills the photoelectric effect for this sodium cathode. Now we want to select the graph option three. Graph option three, and I prefer the option showing the photons. It just looks more snazzy. Okay, now step seven, let's move the wavelength slider full left and right. One and two, and then we take a picture. Okay, let's try that again for our second cathode. Our zinc, full left and right, take a picture. Change our cathode again to copper, full left, full right, take a picture. Couple more times, platinum, full left, full right, take a picture, calcium, full left, full right, take a picture, and finally we have an unknown sample which we'll take a picture of as well. So we look at what energies we get with the change of our frequency. Okay, so this is an energy versus frequency graph, and of course we take a picture. Let's now analyze these graphs. Here's our results from our investigation. As you can clearly see, there's some definite similarities between each of these five graphs. And obviously there are also some differences as well. Let's investigate this relationship in more detail. So here's the summary of our findings. We have the energy in electron volts on the vertical scale. And we have the frequency of the incident light in Hertz. And here's our one, two, three, four, five different metals we used as our cathodes. First of all, what similarities exist in each plot? You can pause here and consider it and come back in a second. Clearly here, all plots have the same gradient. Regardless of the metal cathode, they each have exactly the same rise over run. So the gradient of sodium is the same as the gradient of calcium and that of zinc, copper and platinum. All the rises over runs are equal, the same ratio. What differences exist in each plot? I imagine most people see clearly that the x-intercepts are very different for each one of these five plots. Let's have a look at the conclusion we can find from this investigation. First of all, the gradients of each metal cathode's energy versus frequency graph are identical. The gradient is known as Planck's constant, and Planck's constant, which we use as the symbol h, has a value of 4.14 by 10 to the negative 15 electron volt seconds. Let's explain how this works. We know that a gradient is effectively a rise over a run, well, the rise of these lines is measured in energy in electron volts. The run on the X scale is measured in frequency in Hertz. So it's electron volt per Hertz. Now a Hertz is an event per second. It's a rate of something. So it's really electron volts per per second. So when you divide by a fraction, you effectively multiply by the reciprocal. So instead of saying electron volts per Hertz, this ends up being electron volt seconds. Now, as you know, energy is also measured in joules. So it's possible that we could have a graph that has joules per hertz. Now when we do that, we end up with a different value for Planck's constant. 
our initial value we had was Planck's constant in electron volt seconds, and our alternative value was 6.63 by 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. When solving equations with Planck's constant, you have to read the context of the question carefully to see if we're looking at energy being measured in joules or energy being measured in electron volts. Once again, of course, the gradient is measured in rise in joules by run in hertz, and that ends up being joules seconds. Further our conclusion, the x-intercept of each plot is different. The x-intercept is known as the threshold frequency, and we use an italic f with a subscript 0. So this point here on the sodium graph is the threshold frequency for sodium, where it crosses the x-axis. This is the threshold frequency for calcium, and so forth for zinc, copper, and platinum. And you can see it changes along the x-axis. Each cathode metal has its own unique threshold frequency. The threshold frequency represents the minimum frequency at which a photoelectron will be ejected. If we go below that frequency, no photoelectrons will be ejected at all. This is the minimum frequency. At the threshold frequency, the photoelectron has no kinetic energy whatsoever. So if we look at sodium here, here's our threshold frequency. If we go above that value, we read across, there is some kinetic energy for the photoelectron. If we go a long way past that frequency, we find we have considerable kinetic energy for the photoelectron. A problem to have a look at. Could you identify the unknown sample that was in the VET simulator? This is its graph, and it intersects roughly around about 0.8 by 10 to the 15 hertz. The unknown material's threshold frequency is approximately 0.8 by 10 to the 15 hertz. We look up this table and we can see that thorium has a threshold frequency of roughly 8 by 10 to the 14, which is the same as 0.8 by 10 to the 15 hertz. So this unknown material could be thorium. Let's extend our knowledge a little bit further. The y-intercept, if we were to extrapolate, continue that trend, extend our energy into a negative axis, the y-intercept represents the work function of the cathode metal. So sodium, if we were to continue our sodium line with a dotted line, we find that sodium has a work function around about two electron volts. Calcium also has a work function a little higher. Zinc's work function, copper's work function, and platinum's work function. Now recall the work function is the amount of energy required to remove the least bound electron from the surface of the metal. The work function can also be calculated by the following equation, where phi, the work function, is equal to Planck's constant times the threshold frequency. Of course, if we want our work function to be calculated in joules, we use the Planck's constant that involves joule seconds. And if we want the work function to be calculated in electron volts, we use the Planck's constant that's measured in electron volt seconds. And here's the sample collection of work functions in electron volts. Let's now look at some mathematical modeling. Every straight line has the relationship y equals mx plus c. Let's expand upon this. So y represents our vertical axes, m is our gradient, x is our horizontal axis, and c is our intercept on the y-axis. So y equals mx plus c. Let's substitute the known quantities from the ek versus frequency graph, our kinetic energy frequency graph, into this equation. So y is replaced by energy, either in electron volts or joules, but we'll choose electron volts for this particular example. M, the gradient, is represented by Planck's constant, H. X, the x-axis is frequency, F. And plus C is the work function. Now, because the work function is below zero on the energy axes, we write in as plus minus the work function. So this is a kinetic energy of our photoelectron. HF is the energy of the incident photon, or the light. And the work function is the amount of energy required to release the least bound electron from the metal surface, the metal cathode. Let's simplify that. Ek equals hf take phi. Here's the equation relating all the energies involved with the photoelectric effect. There's a couple of variations we need to be aware of as well. For example, we know that phi, the work function, is equal to hf naught. We could sub that in and provide this equation. Now those of you who are keen mathematicians can see an easy factorization here. So we could take the h factor out and have ek equals h in bracket f take f naught as yet another variation of calculating the kinetic energy of a photoelectron. I trust you've enjoyed this video on the photoelectric effect. In this video, we focused on the effect of frequency upon the maximum kinetic energy of a photoelectron. If you've liked this and learned something, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching.